Hello, my name is Ewan Sue Butts. I'm a human computer interaction researcher at the University College London, and this work comes from a collaborative partnership between Cooth, who are an online mental health service in the UK, and the University of Bristol. I undertook the majority of this work while studying at the University of Bristol, but this project has also included researchers from Monash, Bath, and Lancaster universities too. So, thank you for listening to this talk today. I'd like to firstly start by thanking my co-authors Pranita Shrestsa, Brittany Davidson, Cheng Cheng Q, Charlotte Mindell, Aaron Seffi, Paul Marshall and Roisin McNanny. I want to talk a bit today about what culturally and linguistically diverse means within the context of online mental health services in this study, and also which are, what our findings which centre on the challenges and opportunities for mental health um, from this group mean for HDI researchers and practitioners who are doing research in this area. So before beginning this presentation in full, I would like to acknowledge my own positionality within this work. So I'm a white cisgendered male researcher of mostly Irish heritage, and as we acknowledge as a research team in this paper, whilst we may not share the same lived experiences as the young people we interviewed in this study, we are able to empathise with their experiences and acknowledge this as part of our data analysis. So to begin with, we started by posing the question, how can we design inclusive digital mental health tools for culturally and linguistically diverse young people? Posing this question helped us to approach the understanding of how we can create future tools and services that better cater to culled young people's needs. This study builds directly on our understandings of young people's mental health, online services, digital mental health tools, and mental health service provision in the UK context, which is where this study took place. And this work also builds on literature looking at the effect of individuals' lived experiences with specific chronic mental health conditions, as well as literature on the effects of social media on young people's mental well-being. Our study comprised three main parts. Firstly, once people had been recruited and selected, we onboarded and interviewed five digital mental health youth workers working in online services to ask them about their experiences in each service. As the researchers were not culled ourselves, we elected to recruit culled professionals and culled youth for the study itself. The interviews with professionals helped outline the landscape of the area they worked in, and we discussed their own work experience, how they helped youth out with their problems, and what they felt were the main challenges and barriers to good mental health service provision. These interviews set the scope for the online survey and in-depth interview sections which followed with culled youth. People found out about the study through our partner Cooth and from online advertisements put up by the research team where people could complete the informed consent process. This also applied to both the professionals and the culled youth that were recruited for this study. Once data was collected, a reflexive thematic analysis process was followed in order to code the data, which was then iterated upon by all the authors in the study in order to reach the final themes that we provide in this paper. The first phase took place between the researchers and online mental health service providers and revealed to us how the culled professionals work with youth and other offline organisations such as the NHS in the UK. These interviews reveal professionals' experiences working with schools and colleges and some of the cultural and religious traumas and stigmas that arise when providing youth support. They also discussed their impressions of working across different services and how these varied from both online and offline settings. The first round of interviews was used to inform the structure of questions in phase two in our online survey. The content of the survey was scoped with the professionals who reviewed the questions before sending these out to Cald Youth. The research team then reviewed the responses and used the data from these first two phases to scope the in-depth interview questions in stage three. In phase two, the survey allowed us to probe into the specific kinds of problems that youth experience when seeking mental health support from both online and offline services. The survey covered topics such as gaining access to services, seeking help from trusted sources, how long people wait on average to access services, and also how services could be more specifically tailored to age ranges. Stage 2 survey responses were again informed by the professionals we interviewed in Stage 1, and these also set the scope for the interview questions we used in the in-depth interview topic guide in Stage 3. For stage three, we probed nine cold interviewees about their online service experiences and how this compared with counterpart offline services such as the NHS's Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service in the UK. This elicited a range of responses from our participants, from discussions about exclusion in the school place, to transferring to an online setting, not feeling comfortable sharing their personal mental health experiences on online forums, especially when they weren't properly moderated, as well as difficulties sharing cultural identity on social media, and even experiences from one participant of online creator fame affecting their mental health. 
So our paper covered a range of different types of challenges that cold youth face, including cultural stigma around mental health, formal versus informal support online, the process of transferring between different mental health services online and offline when reaching a certain age, communication online between peers, and also trust. But for the purposes of time today, I'll just talk about a few of these in a bit more detail, and next just highlight some interesting quotes from our participants around the culture, support, and communication preference themes. So we had a range of professionals talk about how young people felt their cultural identity and mental health conditions were perceived from family members, friends, and services. Many people felt like if they aligned with a the religion, then their beliefs were often going to get conflated with their mental health condition, or others would describe their own religious beliefs to the young person's mental health. Others also felt that discussions around mental health always resulted in talking about extreme examples like institutionalisation or being put in an asylum, as opposed to the more general everyday discussions around mental well-being. As one professional describes, there is a real fear of services. That's still a barrier. There aren't a lot of culturally appropriate services, and there's a distrust of institutions, whether it be health and social care or policing. These fears of institutionalisation often lead to a fear of using or accessing services, which in turn can further burden either formal or informal caregivers of these young people, and also the health service. We saw worries from many of our young people in both the survey and the interviews about gaining access to formal mental health support, for example through the NHS in the UK, but also when going out and seeking one-to-one -one support in an online space. When access to services proved difficult, either due to not having a cultural context recognised or due to the service's own capacity, then young people would turn to their peers for support next. However, there were also worries expressed by participants that their sharing with peers could result in bullying or entrenched stigma, thereby worsening any pre-existing mental health conditions rather than supporting them. Our participants also discussed their experiences of trying to seek out support online too. In this quote, our participant describes how they experienced long waits for access to mental health support, even within the online space, and that this waiting can prolong and even exacerbate underlying mental health conditions. During the Stage 3 in-depth interviews, the Carl young people expressed positive interactions and also challenges they experienced communicating with one another about their mental health. Positively, young people felt that they were able to share most through online forums, where they could reach out to people like them, either with similar mental health experiences or from similar cultural backgrounds, who might be sharing a similar mental health experience as they are. This meant that they could seek out advice from these people and share resources to help one another better. More challenging were the difficulties in communicating an extensive history of mental health experience to a new therapist or to a new service. Often people found that records were missed or that new counsellors and therapists didn't have a full grasp of their history or that they couldn't convey this in a way that made them empathise fully enough with the experiences they were going through, especially when engaging with a brand new therapist. In this quote, our participant describes their experience starting to work with a new therapist. They demonstrate here how they've developed resilience by identifying which topics they feel they can talk to the therapist about and which ones they want to avoid. In this case, this is due to a perceived lack of understanding about their negative experiences going through school. So what did we learn? Overall, our findings showed a range of ways that Cal's youth sought out reassurance and safety online, including self-moderating and engaging only with others that they perceived as safe. This included seeking out individuals with similar cultural identities and backgrounds to them when they first started to use a new online service. Professionals' roles were also varied and many felt that they needed greater support themselves to make the services that they work with more inclusive and informative for the cold youth that they support. However, there are still areas that services for cold youth can be improved further. One of the central and pervasive issues across all of the themes in our study centred around trust in services at varying levels. On the one hand, trust in online services was discussed in relation to the lack of information available in a crisis for young people, and who young people turn to when they are in desperate need of assistance and can't find the information that they're looking for. For example, if a young person could find resources quickly in a crisis, then greater trust was placed in the service overall. Also, therapeutic content such as videos or tailored resources that could help someone in a crisis when a therapist isn't available physically or digitally could help to reduce trauma and alleviate worry. Representation could be better supported through allowing service users to co-create content that represents them. 
Service owners and designers could then embed this content in the service's publicly facing content libraries to evidence to the public that its users are actively contributing and are equitable contributors to the service. Lastly, services could match users with cold professionals with similar lived experiences to them or with similar expertise to the support that's being sought by the young person. However, there is a risk that this could come across as a token gesture and services should avoid tokenistically matching supporters to youth if, for example, they only share a similar cultural background and do not match with similar mental health conditions. We encourage future HCI researchers and practitioners in this space to consider four key areas. Firstly, cold youth require regular and timely access to professionals through online services. Our findings reveal the ad hoc nature of one-to-one -one appointments and the struggles that setting up frequent and regular appointments entails. Researchers can investigate further how cold youth can build resilience away from one-to-ones with professionals and also how to reduce over-reliance in peer content. An extension of this could be to investigate how peer content is moderated by professionals and what's deemed both helpful and accurate information that can be shared on online mental health platforms. Both online and offline transitions for youth as they are aged between services also require much more scaffolded support to be effective. A future investigation into the time and cost of these transitions and their cost efficacy could also be beneficial to individual countries' health services, both online and offline. There is an opportunity to further investigate culturally empathetic practices with professionals too, for example through service-focused co-design and participatory design sessions. These could focus not only on ways of combating stigma, but also on how culture can be embedded within services in a way that's not just an add-on to existing support, but it's actually embedded in the services content. Finally, up-and-coming technologies such as AI and chatbots could also augment services when they are under pressure to help triage youth problems, but not to replace them. This could support counsellors and help to reassure youth, giving them an estimate of when they can speak to a person or what other avenues of support might be open to them when the service is under pressure. We hope you found this talk informative and please do look at our paper for further details. We'd also encourage you to get in touch and feel free to ask questions again during the CHI session or to contact us by email if you'd like to ask any more questions about this work later.